Thank you all for coming up, coming out today on such a beautiful uh, uh, spring day. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Miriam with us. Miriam's been here since Friday, and uh, she now knows the weather's always like this mm -hmm. here in, uh, in Bloomington. I mean, she's got a run of three days. It's, 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 it must be like this all the time. Um, so she was at a conference uh, that we used to workshop sponsored over the, over the weekend. Uh, Miriam is a professor um, in political science at, at UCLA. Um, she's extremely well published in a lot of different areas. Uh, she uh, has a recent book out on corruption. Uh, it's a topic of this uh, paper today. She's got a very strong interest in uh, governance of, of natural resources as well. Uh, coming at it uh, from the political science uh, side of, of things, which is needed. Um, she's got awards, publications, and a lot. So we don't have very long introductions in the interest of time, uh, but we're very uh, pleased that she's here with us. So Miriam knows the rules, five minutes more or less, and then we'll dive in. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and for the opportunity to test out on you a paper that no one else has read. Uh, so I just want to give you um, two minutes of background so that you understand how, where the problem came from that we're working on in this paper. This is a figure from the book I wrote with Ray Fisman on corruption. Which shows the Corruption Perceptions Index, which is a measure of corruption in different countries around the world, by log of GDP per capita. Um, we have uh, inverted the Corruption Perceptions Index so that lower values mean less corruption. And so you can see here that uh, corruption declines very strongly with um, economic development. And the truth is, like, everybody knows that. So I've been looking at that figure for about 10 years and saying, why is this? Um, corruption declines with economic development. And honestly, most other bad things decline with economic development. You know, infant mortality declines with economic development. <coughs> and education rises. And just many things get better uh, as countries get richer. This is one of those things. It didn't seem, it didn't seem very possible to make much headway in thinking about how government improves with economic development on the basis of information at this level. And then I, um, and then I said, you know, why don't we just like <coughs> whack together the data on re-election rates? Nobody's done that. Nobody's looked at it. The data sits out there, and nobody has looked at it. And uh, I started putting together the data that is in Figure 1. And by the time we had 20 or 25 countries put together that included some less developed countries, my research assistant, graduate student Eugenia, who's a co-author on the paper, and I were looking at it and going, OK, like, everybody knows this. Nobody knows this. Nobody has seen this. This is like looking at re-election rates by economic development, and we see a pattern. That's kind of amazing. Let's keep going. She became very um, interested in this and is now up to 112 countries and still going. She thinks we'll be able to eventually get close to 200 countries on into the figure. Uh, and the pattern continues to hold. That is, there's a very clear relationship between re-election rates and economic development. Well, when I show that to people, they, they have one of those aha moments, like, yeah. It's as if we ought to have known it, but we didn't know it. Um, and so this gives me now a way to, to theorize that 
because now I know who the actors are. They're politicians, and they're either not getting reelected or they are getting reelected. And those are, to put it informally, two different worlds for, uh, for politicians. They're worlds in which they can rent seek with abandon and they're going to get thrown out of office, or they're worlds in which they basically do a good job and they get reelected. Um, and so then I was fortunate enough to uh, get Stefan Walton, who's a very gifted young theorist, um, to agree to come into the project. And um, he got very excited about the, the data we were working with. And so he has written the formal model. It's not in the paper, because I didn't want you to ask me any questions about it. <laughs> so he's already written the model. Um, and the main challenges for this project, which we see basically as going into a book, are empirical challenges, not the modeling. Challenges, um, they're challenges about uh, how to get an empirical handle on, on what's going on here and the different ways that the different possible mechanisms could change the selection effect uh, between low-income and high-income countries. So thank you, and I hope that you'll be, um, I hope that you'll take into consideration that how, that I finished the paper just for you, and I obviously <laughs> couldn't even finish it. So um, it is what it is. It was kind of familiar by saying, well, you know, paper really works better with you know, something that you're working on. Went from slides to get this out, so I thank her for that, and I'm I'm very happy. I think it's a great discussion piece. So, floor, Federica. Thank you. This is fantastic. I enjoy reading it uh, very much. I have two questions. One uh, about the assumptions that goes uh, behind the, the sort of like what you expect uh, a politician to look like when it gets reelected, and another one has to do with the uh, sort of like a confusion perhaps in my in my head about uh, things like patronage and things about corruption that seems to have a very, very different time horizon. So starting with the assumption, it seems to me that there is an assumption around uh, that, that sort of like a, um, uh, it informs the paper uh, that perform, like, the reaction is based on performance. And it seems to me that this is problematic in light of what we know about voter behavior. Uh, it, it's unclear to me that that the, the incentives of voters, particularly when it comes to uh, 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 poor and rich countries, don't change, right? So if you if, if your election has to deal with the, the threat of starvation, is going to be different if your the election is going to have to do with like whether I get a bridge or not, right? And so voter behavior, voter incentives change, determining different sort of like a, attitudes towards uh, participation in re-election, uh, but also. Um, it seems to me that there is just an assumption that performance is not necessarily what voters vote when they vote for an incumbent. Uh, and this is just uh, as a clarification. The other one. So uh, let me let, yeah. can I can we let me stop you so we can talk about the first question. Okay. Okay. So let me see if I've understood you correctly. You think there is the assumption in the paper that voters vote on the basis of performance. Correct. Yes. And you want to know how. Vote. You want to know how that may change, or how that calculus may change, but in between voters in very poor countries and voters in rich countries. Right. So let me tell you about that, um, because I um, I've thought about that a lot, particularly in connection with uh, the uh, field project I'm doing in Pakistan right now, um, where we try to uh, give information to voters. Um, so I think that voters vote on performance in all contexts. I mean, this is a set of assumptions. It's a stylized fact. This isn't a real psychological fact about individual voters. Um, we can assume voters vote on performance in all settings. In uh, wealthy countries, voters vote on aggregate performance metrics. So they vote sociotropically, basically. So the Standard way we think about that is in terms of economic voting. And in poor countries, voters vote on uh, individualistic metrics of performance. So 
basically the electorate is um, pulverized into individuals or families that are making, or maybe clans even, that are making decisions based on improvements to their specific group uh, over the prior period. In that setting, the politician um, can uh, play groups of voters off against each other so that they bid down the outcome. And so they never get anything from the politician, but they always throw the guy out. Does that answer your? That actually sort of like a, a, a generates another question, which is, well, then like <laughs> something has like party party dominance and sort of like a, a inner like governmental like vari variation seems to require some sort of like additional. Okay, so what I think happens on the voter side okay. is that voters shift from using individual clientelistic based criteria for re-election to using aggregate sociotropic criteria for re-election. On the voter side, I think that's the, the shift that permits good governance. Um, and that may occur just naturally as a, a result of economic development and the eradication of extreme poverty, for instance. Uh, so far, that's sort of what the literature says. Oh, poor people vote clientelistically, and once they get a certain <coughs> level of affluence, they don't need to do that anymore, and so then they vote on the basis of sociotropic criteria. Um, to the extent that the literature says anything about how voters shift this calculus, which it doesn't really, that's what it says. So I am not sure I would be satisfied with that or that I will be in the end, but I'd go with that for now. Okay. Um, just just, just on, on that point, mm -hmm. I mean, that certainly fits the U.S. over time. So we went from boss <laughs> politics in the late 19th century, very clientelistic. Uh, it also, one thing to, now that I have the floor, to add on to that is, that needs to be explored is, where's the money? Where's the rents? So in the 19th century US, the money was not at the federal government. The money, except for the railroads, big scandal there, but except for that, all the money was in state and local hands. So building lights, building bridges, building infrastructure for cities, that's why mayors had so much power and governors, and they were able to skim by over-invoicing and then kicking it back to poor uh, uh, voters, uh, many of whom were immigrants or sons and daughters of immigrants. So, uh, uh, so it fits the temporal story of, I think, a lot of developed countries but how corrupt you can be depends on your opportunity cost, depends on where the rents are as well. And, and so I think that's not, you have a generalization about that in the model about you know, private offers versus public offers as time goes by and corruption, people are punished for it. But, um, is it on this or? Uh, Dean was in right, the Dean go. Dean just. <coughs> I wonder if you could put up your figure one again. You mean from the paper? From the paper, yeah. Um, I think. You have that? Yeah. Yes, yes. I thought you had that. Um. <clears throat> Is that what that was? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so yes, re-election rates. It starts with that. It does, to me, it doesn't look like there's a relationship here at all. I don't know what that equation means. I that is, but if I just look at, if I try to do an eyeball regression, almost all the observations outside of that line, I don't know what, what you've got there, and you're not weighting it by, countries are all treated the same, you're not weighting it, and you're not controlling for the different character of the, of the legislators. Um, so, you know, I don't know what what's going on there, but I wouldn't, I mean, that seems like a, I don't know, an odd way to start a project uh, with that as your, as your Finding, uh, you know, you know, you know, puzzle, I suppose. So, uh, I wonder if you could address that. Uh, hmm. 
Okay, so there is a statistically significant relationship um, to the extent that that, that convinces you um, between uh, per capita GDP and the mean re-election rate. Um, I think it's rather interesting that that relationship exists despite the fact that we have not taken it, we're not controlling for anything here, uh, and yet we do see a pattern. The pattern to some extent is obscured by some of these very small uh, countries that we have included with less than a million that are normally left off figures like this, uh, precisely to make patterns more obvious. So um, some of the outliers are like very small uh, countries and islands and things that are often, yeah, like, who know, I don't even know what continent it's on. Um, so uh, we haven't controlled for anything. We haven't controlled for how long the country has been democratic. That matters. We haven't controlled for whether it's a presidential or parliamentary regime. We haven't controlled for whether it uses um, a proportional representation or single member districts or anything about district magnitude. We haven't controlled for, and one thing we should do, before, not even control, we should drop the countries like Mexico, where legislators actually are prohibited from being reelected again. Mexico is in here, and that's one of the few countries of the, where we just should pull it out, because it's not even relevant to Mexico. And so otherwise, it seems to me the fact that there is any pattern at all across all of these different institutions and uh, regime types and size of countries and everything, that that's what makes it interesting. I don't know what we would weight the data by, um, whether you, you might want it weighted by the size of the legislature, perhaps, or the number of houses or something. This is only the lower house. Uh, all of those are things that we will do, um, and we'll put them in tables. Uh, where we present in the appendix. Um, I happen to, so what I consider the most interesting problems to work on are the puzzles that emerge out of the real world where you just look at the world and you go, wow, why should that be? And to me, this is a wow, why should that be kind of story because we just would have thought that all that patronage and vote buying in the poor countries meant that those guys never were thrown out of office. That's what, if you had asked anybody, they would have said, Be, there are 50 books on clientelism, and they all assume clientelism is effective, and that means we should never see those legislators in poor countries lose office, and yet they're losing office at extremely high rates. And so, to me, that is really uh, worth investigating. Yeah. Have I convinced you? Just, well, I saw a talk the other day where a guy showed a, 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 a similar diagram showing uh, police plotted against crime rates, very tight, positive relationship, and uh, you know what's going on there. Police more plotted police, against more police talk? cause more crimes the other way around. And I this see. Is, you know, so I, I think you start with the more fun. You know, I think you start with the more fundamental. Question: What determines re-election rates? Maybe what determines GDP? You know, but there's a lot of you can find a lot of causation, you know, correlations out there. And I don't know if that's the way to. So let it. me tell you, this is not so. To in my to my mind, this figure is the answer to the question. The question is why does corruption decline with economic development? This is the story that explains the. The, the, that you can model at the level of political actors to understand why corruption and governance improve with economic development. This is, this is puzzling based on what we know about the world. I don't think it's the kind of, it's, this is not a bogus endogeneity graph, the way the police and crime figure is. But I, just on, on this, I, mean, I think the way I view econometrics, even this is not as test but as a diagnostic so that you know you, you know this is very 
preliminary. So, you know, as you said, you haven't added any other things that could affect this. Um, and if we think about this in light of the, the model, it's really your outside option for where the rents yeah. are and your likelihood of being punished for corruption. But it's your outside op. So suppose you're not punished at all in poor countries. Um, for but it could be that it's not log GDP, but maybe changes in GDP. I and mean, there's a lot of rents, for example, in telecommunications industry. So you may decide, hey, you're a politician, and then there's a lot more money I can make by skimming somewhere else in a private firm. So it's it's. You know, so I'm just thinking there's ways of adding controls that that get at this more uh, in a more nuanced way. But I think there's more going on th th than just this. And this is just the first step. And I, you know, I think it's really you know it's really fascinating. The, on this point, it, it, let me just ask: Have you? Uh, I didn't see it in here, but I might have missed it. Did you ever uh, get? Uh, a little bit goes to Dean's question at the size of the country itself as an oh, explanatory yeah, variable. Right, right. and, and the reason I'm asking yeah, is exactly. all of the countries across the top with very high re-election rates are tiny countries. It's interesting. And having lived in a tiny country and watched the politics, it's it's, it, it's a world of its own. That's interesting. And, and, yeah. um, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that everyone's family. Uh, and, and so it, it might be that you actually strengthen your yeah, right, right. your your results by bringing in that variable to say, well, let's see what we can do with that. I know it's preliminary, so right. We know we would strengthen our results if we removed the countries with populations of under a million. No, but having them in there is interesting. Or, I think yeah. is Ken's point. Yeah. It's so just added as a variable. Yeah. As an explanatory yeah. variable. Um, I I tend so I agree with you that uh, that will be a great way to go. Um, I would rather start with just looking at the data before I start running regressions. So Eugenia has already been running some of these regressions, but I didn't even, I don't even want them in here yet. I just want to get to know the data first. Yeah. But yeah. Just sorry. Um, so I think the, the stage is facing really cool place to have a conversation. Um, and one of the places that I wanted to have that conversation is about how you're thinking about this theory-wise. So, because um, to me, like, I, I like the idea of exploring the data before you have any thoughts about what you might control for or not. Like, like I, I want to have an understanding a little bit more about where the theory is. You sketch it out in here, but it seems to be a selection-based effect, right? This is that when economic development increases, the kind of person that wants to go into politics is fundamentally different than the kind of person that wants to go into politics in low-income countries. And it seems to me that there is the potential, and you're looking for empirical strategies, to use temporal effects, or sort of temporal differences here, right? Because if that's actually the case, then we shouldn't see significant changes over time across the same incumbent. Right, like we should, like so. Right. So one question. So so that is both a comment, but also a question. What is the temporal sort of trajectory of your theory? Here? What happens first? Right. Is it economic development increases, which usually happens slowly, and is there a point at which the private gains to the private, like the sector, the, the you know the benefit gains the private sector. Um, outstrip the economic gains the public sector and then you only get people in the public sector that care about doing public work in some way or another or I guess so I'm trying to I'm trying to like sort of understand this sort of temp like what happens first right and, and what is the because I think a little bit to Federica's point of the sort of um, these processes happen at different speeds I think and so what how do they align and, and what is the are they parallel is it how does that happen so in our model, bad guys would always enter politics at every level of development, regardless of the outside option, because they could rent seek, um, and because the, that way you get something for nothing. And so they always want to go into politics. 
at every level of development. At some point in the process of development, and this clearly differs country by country, something changes that prevents them from doing that. That is, the institutions that exist begin to prevent them from stealing. And what changes is really what we want to explore empirically. My instinct is to say that, like, it's going to be fast. Those changes will probably be very rapid. So there'll be a sudden transformation where at before you could rent seek with abandon and then the FBI swoops in on mayors and starts arresting them, for instance. Or before you could rent seek with abandon and the uh, courts <coughs> suddenly become empowered and start prosecuting um, uh, can, uh, candidates for office who have engaged in illegal activity. Before you could rent seek with abandon and all of a sudden the press gets wise and starts publicizing and voters get information and change their voting. And so I imagine, but I don't know, that there are going to be sudden sort of breaks in how things happen, where, poli where politicians suddenly go, oh, whoops, this won't work anymore. I think I'll go do something else. Okay. But you know, there has been so little work historically in looking at those sorts of things that so, we don't know okay, that So that leads me to one follow-up question slash idea, and then one paper, which I sort of mentioned to you earlier. Uh, the follow-up question idea is it seems like you have the possible possibility of saying something about endogenous institutional change here also. Mm -hmm. Right, so if people are being recruited or are selecting, being selected into an institution that now either you know does or does, which happens is the institution change both with the new politicians that are in there that are supporting that change. How does that actually happen? You seem to be aiming, angling not towards a sort of gradual endogenous institutional change, a little bit more towards a critical juncture something. But that seems like a really interesting potential avenue to go. The other, the paper that comes to mind, and I mentioned this to you, I'd just be curious about, uh, with your co-author, about how that model fits with the um, uh, Dalbo et al. piece from APSR in 2006 called Plato and Plomo, which is about bribery um, and the sort of way corruption shapes who gets into office and who doesn't and what their incentives are. Because um, it has some of the similar implications of what you're saying, but I'm just not sure if the mechanics are working the same way that you that you guys are arguing they might. So it just might be something we're thinking we'll get and send it to you, but done. So I know Delbo has done work, related work, that shows that the, that uh, argues that wages increase with economic development, and that's interesting, but irrelevant to what we're doing. Um, ours is not a wage story, and it's, it's really not a wage story. It's a rent-seeking story. Yeah, first here. Uh, so I guess I kind of got answered in this, but I, I, the way I was reading, I was confused where the causation was, right? It seems like to me institutions are the thing, with your recent comments just kind of get to this. Yeah. Uh, and so like to me, it's it's reminding me of Slifer's story of the lawyers and the engineers, you know, it's something switching. So it's, it's actually away from rent seeking. Because uh, I was a little confused with your wording in the paper, where you say, hence the individual motivated by rent seeking turned to private sector. But I guess what you actually mean is that they turn to profits. Uh, and so it's also reminded me of Obama's stuff on uh, productive, unproductive, and destructive mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. Um, so I guess that part kind of got answered. But the other thing I was wondering if you were thinking about this is uh, in the public choice literature, a lot of <laughs> voters, we do listen to the evidence, but we're very myopic. Right, so uh, how, how long of a distance between the things that they can do, right? So I guess the political business cycle theories, uh, have you looked into that, maybe about the, the time span that, uh, that, the, that the booms need to take place around elections? So uh, performance criteria uh, in developed countries that voters use are very imperfect, <laughs> is I think what you're saying. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> voters are not able to use all of the information that is potentially available to them. I agree. Um, that it, 
I'm not sure that that will change anything with what we're looking at at all. And, and you're certainly right. What we're doing is really institutional. That is the, the causal um, effects that we are hoping to identify are all institutional changes that cause the bad types to, to decide that politics is no longer a good game for them. So let me put it this way. Why were we all so surprised? Most of us were very surprised when Trump was elected, not only because we were surprised at the outcome, but because it, he seemed so unsuited for politics. Why would somebody like that want to go into, into politics? Like, the guy made a mistake. He didn't understand that there's rule of law and that you can't rent seek in our system. Maybe he was right. You can apparently push it further than uh, than anyone has tried for a while. But I, I hope you take my point here, and with no offense meant to anyone who might be a Trump supporter. Please. Thanks. <clears throat> so one question that came to my mind is whether this could be something related to party institutionalization, such that in older democracies, parties are more institutionalized, they are built upon existing cleavages. So this is as these parties are institutionalized, they survive longer with their members. So it's a change among parties rather than parties within, representatives within parties that might be driving this mechanism. I hope I was able to communicate. It, absolutely. So what I think in part may be going on, at least in some cases, is that parties begin to serve as effective gatekeepers to the kind of people who enter politics. In poor countries, you have parties, but they are really the prisoners of the candidates who want to enter and who have enough money to do so. They are not very good at candidate selection. In wealthy countries, they are typically quite good at candidate selection, and they force bad guys off the lists. Um, the U.S. Is an, is an exception to that because we have very decentralized sort of self-nomination, but in most other countries it's pretty different. Um, so I do think that parties are very important. <coughs> Theoretically, I'm, I am not sure yet of how I want to interpret their role. Um, and Stefan and I have had a lot of very heated debates about the role of parties, as a matter of fact. So it's an issue I, that is under active consideration but, uh, um, among the authors of this work. <laughs> John. Does your data allow you to look at what you might call like scale differences? So it might be the case in a poor country that you get very low turnover, so high reelection at like the national level. But as you go to more local level politics, you get more turnover. Does, did, does your data allow for that? Sorry. In some cases, yeah. So the only country that I have personally looked at recently is Pakistan, although I also know the Indian data. It's because I'm doing work in Pakistan. And so we see, um, we see very low re-election rates um, in Pakistan, which is right here. Uh, and if you look at the four provinces in the country, re-election rates are even lower. There, that is, there's even more turnover at the lower rates. Um, I'm not sure. I, that's India, and I think that at the state level, it's pretty heterogeneous, but that the average is going to be even um, more turnover. So I don't, does that, but yes, for some countries, it's possible to put the data together to look at state <coughs> or provincial level. Do you, do you think that trend would carry across? Or would there be a difference in whatever pattern that might be in wealthier countries? Uh, so that's a very interesting um, question. I don't know. I'd have to think about it. I, I haven't thought about it. That it's very interesting. But if you just I don't think know. of the U.S., like the U.S. is also a real outlier. So our re-election rates are really high. It, 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 but there's an interesting it, observation here, and it, 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 it seems to me that this invites a lot of additional questions beyond just the, these oh, two yeah. axes. Um, 
Australia, Great Britain, New Zealand, USA, uh, and Ireland are all in that little tiny clump up there. Yeah. And it, it says, well, so what's similar about all of us? Narcissistic. Well, yeah. so <laughs> one thing is that we, Eugenia and I have looked, if you control for uh, the number of years that countries have been democratic, there's a big effect oh, that's in, in strengthening uh, the ability of incumbents to get reelected. That's, yeah, so that's that, we, yeah. I think that's what's going on with those yeah. countries, but there that's may be other things as well. That's interesting. So we were, um, Mike, we can just... I was going to ask about the partisan uh, structures and the change in the partisan structure, so I think... Uh, already asked my question, so I'll pass the next one. Okay, Barb. Um, two questions that relate to analytically understanding the analysis. Um, I don't do research in this area, so one thing that came to my mind was it wasn't clear to me really what the definition of corruption is here. And, and importantly, do you take into account that corruption itself or how forms of corruption themselves can evolve over time? As governance structures and institutions evolve, so can methods and mechanisms for corruption. And so if you're assuming that there's a simple definition of corruption that remains unchanged over time, that's not going to get picked up here. Um, I've seen that a lot in the United States when you study governance systems. And you see the different ways in which, at least from a legal point of view, uh, corruption can be defined and how you can change through rules and institutions. You make it, you can actually create new forms of corrupt, corruption as well as try and um, block older forms. And then, relatedly, um, It seems to me that, and this sort of picks up, I think, on some of the other comments, that um, you know, the governance election systems themselves can evolve over time, of which party rules and things are just a component, that that themselves can institutionally dramatically affect re-election rates. I mean, you look at gerrymandering in the United States and the severity or the way in which gerrymandering gets manifested itself heavily affects election rates. And we are actually at an entry point, interesting point in this country, the great to which the Supreme Court may or may not finally weigh in on that. But it seems there's ends of not So it seems to me over time, so it gets the question, the question too about the temporal sequence. It's not clear to me how things evolve and change over time, how that's going to get picked up here. Because just as people innovate, technology everything else, people innovate for corruption. They're constantly looking for new ways to do things than they could before. And also you're dealing with degrees of so even if it's rent seeking, whether you do it directly or indirectly through other parties, I mean, you know, other people involved in government, sometimes the the politician, him or herself, doesn't necessarily have to be solely the corrupt individual. It's who enables it. Or some of the politicians are sort of the front people for it. It just seems to me there's a lot more about corruption that I don't and maybe it's because I'm studying this area, I'm not familiar with the definition. But it's not, I don't have a well enough understanding of what's really being measured here and what, therefore, is not taken into account. So certainly in the figure that um, shows corruption, uh, that isn't, um, that doesn't tell us very much about corruption at all. It just measures corruption in some rather, uh, um, gross way, a rough way, I guess you would say, across countries. It isn't, it doesn't tell us what kind of corruption is taking place or who is responsible or who's involved in it or uh, how much money was stolen, if any money was involved. Or uh, it, There's just a lot that it doesn't tell us. All it tells us is how corrupt people seem to perceive each country uh, as being. And that is a pretty imprecise measure of corruption. If you actually go and ask people whether they had to pay a bribe, for instance, 
in the same countries that you ask people how much corruption do you think there is, there is a pretty substantial difference between the numbers of people in the population who report having to pay bribes and the ranking of the country on corruption, and, and those can be quite um, variable, so it, it, there's not even a clear pattern there between uh, how, how often ordinary people are involved in corruption and the ranking of a country. Isn't so, it true that over time, the more developed a country, the more sophisticated mechanisms that can be used to, for corruption to make it less visible? I don't know that. You know, I'll tell you, growing up in Illinois, <laughs> well, it's they have a lot of problems. in Illinois. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. no, the degree, the degree currently still, the degree currently of corruption that's being maintained uh, by Madigan, Speaker of the House and the Chamber, is just off the charts. And all I'm saying, too, is it could reflect, this also could reflect that maybe the more, the longer a country has been institutional democracy, they also could be more sophisticated in how they hide it and, or, you know, a lot of things, the chains in which, which they do it. I'm telling you, clever lawyering, there's a whole lot of things that you can do to hide things. So it's less easily discoverable compared to maybe some of these other countries. So it doesn't, so I'm just, that's why I'm concerned about the index or measure of corruption in the first place. There may be a lot that's not being captured. There's definitely a lot that's not being okay. captured. No question. The expert indi indi indices that are used to capture corruption typically ask business people who are foreigners how much corruption they think there is in countries in which they do business. And they are typically reporting on the basis of whether their company has had to pay bribes, uh, whether they believe that the bureaucracy that they interact with is honest, and what they've read in the newspaper last week. So this is talking about myopia in uh, information. So it's really more an index of perceived by it's a certain complete. vantage. It's not, it's not more an index of perceived. It, it, it is, is called an index of perceived, perceived corruption. That's what I'm saying. That is what it is. It's an index it's of perceived, perceived corruption. Correct. You said this morning about yeah. the sweets. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 I'm on the queue. I wanted to talk about the inherent intuitive logic of the, the, the model. Um, which, which I, I like, but I'm not sure we, I would flip it around. I think rule of law comes first. And rule of law gets you, that's how you become a rich country. Uh, not that you become rich and, and you get rule of law. I mean, there's some endogeneity there. Uh, but I, I, so I think that, you know, we, we don't have good measures of rule of law. I mean, we have measures. We, I think the measures of GDP per capita. So I think those things are proxying for each other. They, they co-developed. Um, but I, if we look at, like if we look at uh, North Walls and Weingast on, you know, social orders and development, you know, rule of law is what seems to be developing over time in developed uh, uh, countries, and. And that allows you to have impersonality, have better contracting, have all kinds of things. So I think that's what makes you rich. Um, and even in the case of Brazil, which you use, um, I don't know if you, you read the uh, sentencing of Lula by Sergio Moro, but what he said was, Mr. President, it gives me no pleasure in issuing this sentence, but you above of uh, uh, you, more than anyone should know, no one is above the rule of law. Uh, and bam. And, and so I think, I mean, I think you've got a good proxy. I mean, I actually think the GDP per capita is proxying for rule of law. So I, I don't know why you have to use it as a mediator. Or you, I mean, in your, your arrow, you've got, you know, GDP going to rule of law and then rule of law going to corruption. I would actually argue rule of law goes to GDP and and it goes to corruption. Uh, but, 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 oh, excuse me. Yeah. But then for the model, why I think GDP per capita is important <clears throat> is because of these outside options that you talk about. In other words, if you're going to be more likely to be punished, and, and I, I found it interesting that you mentioned finance, <clears throat> because 
there's a lot of rents in in finance. We know that, <clears throat> and and so I thought that was interesting that it's not just that your political options changed, but the outside option of where the money is, which is what I mentioned before too, of you know the private sector. There's rents in the private sector, not and not of all of its profits. There's rents, there's corruption, there's all kinds of things. So, but that goes along with this GDP per capita. I think. So the uh, the whole perspective of the North Wine Gas type story is a kind of really big picture where things happen. But you can't tell what's causal, really. It's, sure. it's very and things. It's a very big picture, macro, a lot of endogeneity over time. Sure. So a country gets a little richer, or the rule of law gets a little better. A country gets a little richer again. Other parts of the rule of law operate. It's it. They're not no, really they're, trying they're, to I make think a causal yeah. argument yeah. Yeah. there. I think that's fair. Right. So. Um, I, I am sure that better rule of law can help countries protect their assets and grow their assets. However, most countries that became wealthy, such as the US, for instance, China is making rapid strides, uh, countries become rich without fully functional rule of law. Rule of law is a very complex yes. uh, set of operations. Uh, what we're specifically interested in is not rule of law as this kind of big thing, but rule of law it, from the perspective of a bad, politician. bad politician, which is if I rent seek while in office and engage in corruption and bribery, how likely is it that I will uh, be discovered and potentially locked up or threatened with, uh, with prosecution? And so we're really interested in I, the stories I want to tell are stories at the level of individual people, like the individual politicians, because I that's how I think. And so I want to work on models that um, no, that talk I, about I, these processes <clears throat> from that perspective. I agree. I'm just suggesting that you, you put a lot of emphasis on the the inside option, or called yes. the political option, where I think there's just as much action going on on the outside option that would Empiric cause. So I think empirically there's a lot going on on the outside option. Um, my discussions with Stefan um, make me believe that the model uh, will work with no, despite uh, any changes in the outside option. We don't need changes in the outside option for this model to go through. The outside option is not relevant. Actually demonstrating that and then trying to convince you that the outside option isn't doing the work, I think, would will be a valuable so, part so of this that we're yeah. going to want. Right. And we're going to want to I mean, but all I'm saying is they can both be correct. You know, and, at, and, and they can, because that's what your model uh, says. And and yeah. then it's just an issue of magnitudes and at what at what level. And I only half jokingly said that, which you have in your paper too, about n n n being narcissistic. Mm. Um, oh, right. And I yeah. keep saying, you know, why can't we have more competent politicians in the U.S.? Well, your outside options are so damn good in the U.S. Why would you go into politics uh, when you know, unless you're narcissistic? Um, well, unless you want to yeah, do oh, the right know. thing, like you want yeah. to go into politics not to make money, but because you want to change public policy, and that yeah, th is th why th most th people seem to go into politics. Yes, they're the same ones who are on the student council and everything right. else that we know about. I mean, they have to be exhibitionists and narcissists because who else would want to put themselves in front of the public that yeah. often? Right? Like, we're a bunch of introverted academics. To us, it's just crazy that anyone would do that. <laughs> I think. So, I think I had. Tim, did you want to do anything? Yeah. 
this time. I didn't see it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, jump yeah, in. Yeah, no, no, I, I just, I'm really interested in this party thing, and I, I think, you know, um, it seems like, like the missing thing. It's all been raised before, but I was wondering if the direction of this paper would be to say something kind of provocative about the dark side of party system institutionalization, mm -hmm. especially party career paths. You know, there's, we here in the United States are, especially with Trump and, and actually in Europe now as well, are sort of bemoaning the weakness of party system institutionalization that allows for these kind of outside options within the party system. But here's a story that, you know, it may not be such a good thing to have these very strong career paths like in the UK. I think it's another sort of story. It's like, how are politicians, or say Latin America, how are politicians actually, um, uh, how, are they, how are their ambitions realized? Do you have to put in your dues? Do you have to stay in it, you know? So, and then there's also this movement of, towards, uh, you know, technocrats and things like that. I just, I just, I guess, you know, that sort of, it, it, it very much intrigues me whether or not you want to tell that story or not. Um, that's sort of a, a, an add-on here. So, you know, I think I love political parties. I, I would be hard to write the dark side of political parties because I think they mainly have a good side. I think the problem with the U.S. is our parties are too weak, not that they're too strong. Um, so uh, we would have to talk more for me to understand what you have in mind. <laughs> Uh, so kind of thinking on this, I, I like how you want to focus on the actors in this, but you've said a lot, and it's come up a little, but you mainly talked about the politicians. Well, you know, to me, politics is exchange, so the other side of it is the voters. Uh, and I think that's really where this is coming. So I, the more I'm thinking about this, I think your paper, without saying it expressively, uh, fits into the expressive voting model uh, laid out by Brennan and Lamaski, uh, which basically, you know, argues you know, it's not like we're like making choices like in a market. We don't, we're rationally ignorant, we don't have these things. Uh, so we basically, it's like cheering for a football team, right? We pick our team and we go with it. And we pick the cheapest information possible, uh, which again kind of gets at the, uh, the notion of our measures are not very good. Um, so it, it's not surprising that uh, when you think about it from that model of you know, looking for the cheapest information, well, when we get good growth, yeah, we're going to keep the people in there who are, uh, are doing that. So I'm wondering if you've seen that literature. Uh, and Because uh, there's, for, following Brennan and Maskey, there's been a lot of people who've tried to measure to see how much and if this is really happening. So I don't know that literature. I would love to look at it. The model of voting that I have in mind here is just, is just the standard Fair John Pearson and Tabellini uh, model of accountability. Um, but it's Which, it would really fit. But I would love yeah. to also. I think the more I'm thinking about it, it fits uh, in this. It's, it's really uh, good, and yeah. it would tell your story, because you'd, you'd be using salient measures. Um, yeah. Your perception of corruption is a salient yeah, I measure. I believe their original article was 85. Yeah, about uh, then, their book, back, in their book, I think. Back, yeah. back then. Um, Which, again, would get you at playing around with changes in per capita income, mm -hmm. as opposed to mm -hmm. just the log. Um, so I see there's a lot of people here who want to make things more complicated. My, <laughs> my goal is always to make things as parsimonious as possible. Oh, that's, keep, the, keep it simple. Sounds like an and, and and so the, razor. Obviously the book is going to have to explain why all of the complications yes. you want are not necessary. <laughs> but I, uh, okay. That's what we're here for. Uh, Jess. Okay. And then Federica. Uh, I'll try to keep this short. Uh, first of all, one thing that's kind of interesting about the conversation that happened a few minutes ago over here was that it turns out the people that end up going into office are then either really good types or really bad types with the increase yeah. in the outside option, right? And so one question, yeah, and so right. the problem is you get either the leftovers who don't go into the private option <laughs> or you get the, you right. know, the bleeding heart, I care about the public people. And so the question, and, and, and that seems from the logic that it, you know, like it, you know, that might be one way to differentiate a couple of different mechanisms, right? In terms of like what might actually be going on, is that you know one of your case ideas, one of your sort of empirical ideas, was to look at whether politicians are better educated, whether they're you know, et cetera. So there'd be sort of an ancillary um, empirical puzzle there, to talk about whether the people that actually go into politics are then actually the better people, and that's why they're getting reelected, or uh, you know, there's this wonderful study of Sweden. Um, where they even had IQ measures, you know this one? 
Oof. by Pearson, by Pearson. and in, they, it's an amazing piece of work. They have IQ measures because almost all the politicians in Sweden had were, or may had to take IQ oh, tests when they went into the military. military. Um, and so they have, they were able to access those records as well as all the other records in Sweden where they basically know everything about you. Um, so they found in Sweden, well that might be an unusual country, or at least it's extreme, they found that politicians were truly better than the ordinary person, that they were better educated and smarter and had better leadership qualities and were just, they were just gonna, like they were gonna be really good at their jobs as politicians. Um, I was I don't, that might be one way to rule out this problem right. of the outside option. Yeah, kind of like sort of yeah. so they, de so <laughs> we don't have comparable data for any country other than Sweden maybe, except perhaps Denmark yeah. or something. We, we do have in the U.S. For a certain period of time. For a period of time, of time that's for, correct. Around World War II, that's right. people have used that data yes. uh, to look at to look, right. outcomes. Yeah. Right. So, so, really quickly, I have one or two other quick points. A, do you know if the slope is different for democracies versus autocracies? Well, oh, these countries are all countries right. that have nominally competitive elections at the that's national right. legislature, oh. so there are no true autocracies in here. Um, there are the electoral authoritarian regimes in here, and I haven't, we're, we haven't broken those out yet separately, but okay. we're obviously gonna to wanna to do that. That would be super interesting, especially if we then think about sort of different forms of corruption, right? So it could be the case that like, as better people get in, you go from like full state capture to like smaller forms of bribery. And, I, and it seems like we, we if I recall correctly, and obviously you would know this much better, it seems like the corruption literature has gone to a point where they are doing those kinds of measures. And I was just thinking if you could look at difference, I mean, like from full state capture, right, all the way to like sort of smaller forms and whether that might help a little bit with the temporal question, as well as thinking about whether there might be different kinds of uh, changes in this relationship in the sort of semi-authoritarian versus democratic version, right? Is it that the changes in the democratic go from like, you know, there's sort of marginal marginal increases in sort of lower level corruption, whereas changes in authoritarian electorals go from like, you know, full state capture to like smaller forms of, of corruption. I don't know, it's just, it's just an idea. I think that that happens, and I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what data I would use to show that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that does happen. Yeah. Federico? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm still hung up on the question of performance. Uh, oh. I guess largely because I'm Italian. Um, so, <laughs> so um, if I am like a, a, a good, bad leader, I am going to implement policies that make my constituents better off, regardless of whether those policies are good or bad. So the question of performance and voters, based, voters voting on performance, performance is going to vary dramatically. Um, depending on what kind of structures are in place, but also depending on what the relationship between the constituents and the uh, 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 candidates are, which is why I sort of like a, one of my original question was about the difference between rent seeking and patronage, right? So okay. you are going to be in place if you're a good, like, Roman style patronage guy, but if you just steal like there's no tomorrow, which is not like stealing like there's no tomorrow is not like real a real option. And if if someone is stealing like there's no tomorrow, the it, he's obviously not interested in staying in office, right? So to me, there is something to be done in terms of like the utility functions of both voters and candidates that tend to be more complex. That I'm good, I'm bad, I'm honest, I'm corrupt, and I'm voting on performance as in performance as measurable by like World Bank economic indicators or uh, you know political indicators. Uh, there is a, a, a performance increase that is in the direction of increased rule of law, increased uh, accountability checks. Uh, it seems to me that if I am like a, if I'm playing by the rules, um, and I'm in Italy or in Ghana, uh, uh, my my performance is going to mean something very different than what the World Bank thinks of performance. So, uh, um, let's see. <clears throat> I'm not quite sure I can answer your question, but let me just give you a 
uh, a thought on Italy, or like your question made me gave me an idea <laughs> about what to do. Uh, gave me an idea, so I'm just going to tell you that idea. I don't know if it just misses your question or not. Um, Italy is an unusual country be in the sense that it has higher levels of corruption than you would expect from a GDP, uh, and it certainly had much higher levels of corruption um, until uh, the clean hands operation. I believe that, we ha that the higher levels of corruption were uh, in part a function of the fact that in the South, that, well, two things. First, in part a function of the fact that the levels of economic development in Italy across regions, cross regional, intra regional, inter regional levels of economic development. <coughs> were the variance in interregional levels of economic development in Italy was wider than in any other European country. So the difference between North and South was much greater, so you effectively still had large parts of the country that for many, many years and to some extent even today are still very poor. Uh, and so it's as if the polity were captured by the bad politicians who could still get into power in the South because the rent-seeking opportunities were extremely high in the South. Uh, and the rule of law was very compromised in the South. This leads me to believe that we would also expect to see much more <coughs> turnover of individual level politicians in Italy in the South, let's say in the 50s and 60s, than in the North. And that would be an implication of this. I have all that. I can go back and look right. and see if that's true. But and the interesting period would actually be the post manipulator Of course. Period, right? Because and, you've got the right. end of the 80s boom and uh, incredible recession right. and uh, my get, and, and incredible turnover, right? right? Such that well, no have, one can stay in power except Berlusconi. But you have incredible Let's turnover. No, okay. Uh, so that's a little complicated. You have incredible turnover in 94 when most of the parliament is thrown out and the party system collapsed. But then I haven't looked at the turnover of the politicians post-94 under the new yeah. And that, you would expect to see some kind of period break there. And um, I can also look at that. I also, I don't think that this should explain Italy necessarily. No, but it would <laughs> be. It seems like a high bar. <laughs> that would be interesting if it held at, right, at that level, right. I'd say. Uh, so, um, we try to end on time, but you get the last word. Um, I want to thank you for being such a kind and generous oh, audience and giving me so many ideas to take to my collaborators and to help us um, write a great book. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was really nice of you to put up with something that's really no, no, we actually really.